Peter Becker um, comes to us from Munich and he's actually attending or has been attending a, a Gordon conference in Castel de Fels on chromatin. And this is basically on his way to the airport, a stopover at the very other side of Barcelona. So thanks a lot for that. Um, just a few words about his CV. Um, Peter is originally from Heidelberg, which the Germans like to consider their own Oxford, but it's not that much known. And in there, he did his PhD in the, in the Cancer Institute, which is associated to the University of Heidelberg. After that, he moved to the States to start a postdoc, which then took him into chromatin remodeling. And he did his postdoc with Carl Wu, which many of you might have seen at conferences or remember. And this um, made him become interested in understanding how ATP is used to reorganize chromatin organization. And we'll hear quite a bit about how he has taken this on from that. After that, he was um, junior group leader at the EMBL. And after a few years was called to a professorship position in Munich, where he then also took over the directorship of the Butenan Institute and has been a leading figure in pushing Munich forward to become a real hub of chromatin research. He is director, or let's say the chair of molecular biology, which is now chromatin biology. And he also has influenced the biophysics chair to go into the chromatin direction. Now, even the Max Planck Institute, which is across the, across the street, has a chromatin focus. So this really made Munich the landing platform for a lot of epigenetics researchers over the last year. Um, according to CV, I mean, many of you know Peter Specker's work, so there's little to say. I just can point out that a lot of important prizes have been awarded to Peter. ESC Advanced Grant is one that all of you know. One you might not know is the Leibniz Prize, which is the most important German distinction to the researchers. So Peter, having him today here, for me is also something very personal. Not sure if he knows that, but 22 years ago, when I was a PhD student, pretty much like many of you now, he came to the Max Planck Institute. He gave his first talk there after coming to Munich. And this was the first time I heard about chromatin remodeling. And I still remember some of the slides, which were little cartoons of spools. And, and, and yeah, this basically, didn't really influence me at that point, but it was the first time I heard about it. And when I finished my PhD, I wondered what I should do as a postdoc. And then it happened that Peter and colleagues organized a chromatin conference, part of a network, right across the street at the campus of the university. And this was the first time I heard about his tone variants by Stephen Hennikoff. And you all know that this basically has been a life decision making influence. And so it's a very great pleasure having Peter here today. Thanks a lot for coming, your audience. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here. I've never been here, but I heard so much about the Institute, the Josep Carreras Institute, and um, you are privileged to work here. And it's a real pleasure to stop over actually this was short noted um, normally i don't do this i would like to be here longer and talk to all of you but this is the way it happens and thank you for coming on a friday morning uh, being alerted two days before good um yeah um this is the problem the problem is that many transcription factors, which obviously are very important, they, they bind very short sequence elements. And um, if you look at, if you scan the genome for these um, consensus sequences here, for example, you find that they occur a thousand times. And the transcription factors do not bind all these sites. So how do they distinguish functional sites? from non-functional sites that look very similar. So the protein that I'm interested in, MSL2, we know binds at least 300 functional sites, but there are thousands of sites that look very similar that are not functional. Now MSL2, we know the functional sites very well because they are all 
on the Drosophila X chromosome. You see here the X chromosome in polytene chromosomes in a normal diploid nucleus with an X chromosomal territory. And here you see the mitotic chromosome. So almost by definition, any binding site that's on a, other, on a different chromosome is not functional. Why is MSL2 on the X chromosome exclusively? MSL2 stands for male specific lethal. So in Drosophila, the proteins name, are named after their loss of function phenotype. If MSL2 uh, is mutated, all the male flies die. And that is because MSL2 is part of a complex, an epigenetic regulator. Uh, it's the DNA binding subunit of this complex. And this complex is involved in what is called dosage compensation. Um, there are two male specific components in this complex, MSL2 itself and a long non-coding RNA called ROCs. And this will become important towards the end of the presentation. So what is dosage compensation? Um, like the humans, uh, in males, we have different sex chromosomes. Males are XY and females XX. The genome needs to be balanced, both in males and females. And that requires that in the males, the transcription from most genes is boosted, is activated by roughly twofold. Um, and that kind of reestablishes the balance. In, in humans, it is uh, X chromosome inactivation that is a major part of this balancing the, the two genomes, okay? So this is interesting um, because there are about thousand genes on the X chromosome. They all need to be regulated uh, accordingly. Um, the, uh, only the X chromosomal genes need to be regulated. And this is why MSL2 needs to bind to the X chromosome very specifically. And um, it is a very subtle regulation. It's actually in, in reality, it's less than twofold. And if that does not occur, the male flies will die. It's a beautiful example for fine tuning of gene regulation um, by chromatin organization. So the idea is that this complex binds a, num a series of what we call the high affinity sites. Uh, sorry. And um, from there, once it binds there, it somehow identifies the active genes in the environment, in the proximity, three d dimensional space, and um, it uh, regulates them. And uh, so here you can see the binding to these uh, sequence elements. And then it will find the active genes because they are modified by methylation of lysine 36 of histone H3. This is a mark that is put co-transcriptionally. All active genes have this. And um, this is, according to the current model, is identified by one of these subunits. And then there is an acetyl transferase, histone acetyl transferase called MOF that will acetylate lysine 16. And we think that this uh, unfolds the chromatin fiber and therefore activates transcription. We don't know exactly why this is twofoldish, but at least this is an important part of the principle. So this is an epigenetic phenomenon. An epigenetic histone modification is recognized and then another mark is placed. If you take any gene from an autosome and put it onto the X chromosome, it will be subject to this regulation. So there's nothing about X chromosomal genes. And this is why it is so important to understand uh, the targeting of this complex to the X chromosome, right? And this is what my entire talk will be about essentially. So the, these uh, functional sites have been identified by chromatin immunoprecipitation that you all know, and you see here the peaks, and it had, has identified this sequence here as predominating present in, in these functional sites, and it's called the MRE, 
the male-specific lethal recognition element. As, but as I said, MREs, you find them all over the place and only a very small fraction of them are really functionally important as far as we can tell. Certainly all the sequences on the autosomes are not functionally important. So we wanted to find out how much of the sequence recognition resides in this MSL2 protein, the DNA binding supplement. And so we did an experiment that is not widely used, but is very powerful, called DNA immunoprecipitation. It's very similar to chromatin immunoprecipitation, but here you just take genomic DNA and you break it up in very many small fragments. You add your recombinant protein, immunoprecipitate, so you select the binding sites and sequence. Right. So when we did this, we recovered the same consensus binding sequence, which was very good. So we realized MSL2 is actually the protein that contains a lot of this important information, right? In vitro, genome-wide. Now the problem was these sequences, the functional ones are only on the X, but when we do in vitro, the DNA immunoprecipitation, we get the same consensus sequence, but we retrieve all the autosomal sites as well. So in other words, the intrinsic information in MSL2 is not enough to give you the X chromosome specificity. Right. So, um, was there anything? No. So because this is an in vitro reaction, we can actually play with it. We can put different DNA, but we can also mutate the proteins. And so we have mutated what we thought was the DNA binding domain called the CXC domain. It's a zinc finger type domain. And in a study that we published a few years ago, we realized that this domain has actually the intrinsic ability to recognize a, an extended MRE that has at the five prime end an extended sequence. We call this the Pionex motif pioneering on the X, we realized in this uh, old work that this extended sequence, um, I should say not the sequence, but the motif is highly enriched on the X chromosome. The sequence uh, defined by the position weight matrix is actually find, found all over the place again. But there is a particular shape, DNA shape feature uh, here that makes the sites functional. And if you uh, are interested in that, you should read this old work. Um, uh, the problem was that uh, the Pionex uh, signature is only present in 20% of all the MREs. So in a way, for 80% of these high affinity sites or sequences, we still don't know why the binding is so selective. So if we mutate the CXC domain, MSL2 can still bind DNA, but now it will, will pull down GAGA -GA repeat sequences. And we still don't know why this is. You know, apparently many proteins have this propensity to bind GA sequences. It must be something about evolution. Anyway, but together, you know, uh, together, 20% of Pionex and 80% of GA in the end uh, produces this consensus sequence that characterizes the MRE, right? You have to realize these consensus sequences uh, are made of, um, you know, thousands of different sequences that all contribute positional information. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Anyway, so um, obviously the intrinsic specificity is not enough to um, uh, give you X chromosome specific uh, specificity. And so we considered several um, uh, missing components. For example, cooperativity with other transcription factors, chromatin organization that may suppress non-specific binding. And then MSL2 is a single protein in our assays, but um, uh, you know it's part of a complex with non-coding RNA and so forth. So it could be that the complex has a different binding selectivity. Okay, I will address all of these uh, components here. So 
It was known from work uh, of uh, our colleague Erika Larshan uh, that there is a uh, co cooperative factor, a co cooperativity factor called the CLAMP. CLAMP is a multi zinc finger protein. It's uh, the acronym for chromatin linked adapter for MSL proteins. And indeed, this protein is absolutely required for the dosage compensation complex to bind to the X chromosome. CLAMP itself has a consensus sequence that it likes to bind to. And you may realize that this is very similar to the MRE sequence, right? So when Erika Larshan published this, we had just found that MSL2 has this intrinsic specificity. And so initially we said, nah, this is all, but actually we confirmed it and it's actually true, um, we need the CLAMP. But CLAMP binds to 5,000 sites on the autosomes and all over the place. Uh, so we have not gained any uh, further information really. So in vitro CLAMP recruits MSL2 to its binding site. So now this, it, it turns out for this cooperativity, and I will talk more about this, uh, a physical interaction between the CLAMP and MSL2 is required and uh, CLAMP binds here. So there is a lot of GA binding uh, you know, cap capacity in this C-terminal uh, fragment of the, of the complex. So CLAMP is important, but is it, is it sufficient? And, and what, how about chromatin? So now a little excursion into uh, Drosophila developmental biology. Dosage compensation is established very early in uh, development. Uh, if, the, if there is a mutation in one of these MSL proteins, the males die about here. This is about three hours into development. And this is the time when the chromatin is organized and the compartments are formed and so forth. Before that, the chromatin is immature. Uh, and Trosophila has a very special uh, life cycle in that early on, there is no transcription. It takes about two hours of rapid nuclear replications until the chromatin matures. So we wanted to establish in vitro the most physiological chromatin to actually uh, reconstitute this dosage compensation reaction. And so uh, we decided to use an extract from very early embryos uh, to set up this chromatin. Now, this sounds a bit weird, uh, but uh, the reason why we decided to generate this cell-free system uh, is actually uh, embedded in my personal history as a researcher. And so for a little excursion, I'll take you back about 30 years when I indeed was a postdoc uh, with Carl Wu. I'm sure whether you know, so this is Carl. I just met him at the Gordon conference. Um, uh, and here you see me with an old group photo together with Carl. So when I was a postdoc, um, I had uh, decided I would like to reconstitute DNA's one hypersensitive sites in the cell-free system. So DS, DNA's one hypersensitive sites is not known to many of you anymore because you know attack seek, so which is actually also probing open chromatin. But the first chromatin opening was actually found by DNA's one hypersensitivity. You take nuclei, you incubate them with the enzyme DNA's one, a non-specific DNA's, and DNA's will cleave wherever the chromatin is open. And the hypersensitive sites are the promoters and enhancers and so forth. And 30 years ago, this was pretty new because Carl Wu actually had invented the method. And I thought this was a good lab to do this. So, um, so at the time to do chromatin reconstitutions in this physiological system, we had frog egg extracts. So the Xenopus frogs uh, eggs you know, are loaded with maternal components. And if you make prepare an appropriate extract and incubate your plasmid in it, it will be assembled into chromatin. And so I use Xenopus X to reconstitute chromatin, but then as a source of transcription factor and transcription, I used a very active extract from Drosophila embryos, 
but not early embryos, but later embryos. Carl Wu had this uh, factory to collect embryos. And so there, it, the experiment was chromatin assembly and xenopus egg extracts, in vitro transcription in Drosophila embryo nuclear extracts. And uh, I, I had just um, managed to set up the system when, um, when a crisis happened. And the crisis came when I ordered frogs from the company uh, to prepare egg extracts. And the company says, we cannot deliver. Okay, when can you deliver? Uh, I, I don't think we can de deliver anymore because in 1989, when I was just ready to do more, the more important experiments, there was a trade embargo uh, against South Africa. Uh, the United States wanted to punish South, South Africa because of their apartheid politics. And it turned out that the frogs that we were all using in research were collected in the wild in South Africa, transported to the United States, and we bought them from the company. And the, the breeding took too long, in fact. It was much easier to import them. But because they reinforced the trade embargo, there were no frogs, and my whole postdoc project grinded to a halt. I had just developed the methods to actually reconstitute hypersensitive sites and see. So this was a big crisis, but you know, sometimes crises are also uh, you know, breaking points for new developments. Uh, and I was lucky to have to get this idea that tr the Drosophila early embryonic development is very similar to the frog early embryonic development. The eggs are loaded with maternal components, histone modifications, and so uh, histone assembly components, and so forth. And there is a time when there's no transcription. And so if we were only uh, able to prepare extracts from the super early embryos, then I could overcome my frog problem. And here you actually see uh, the, the development, you know, here's the back of factors, a single nucleus, and then there's nuclei divisions, and there are repli replications. Every, every eight minutes, there's an exponential increase in nuclei, and they all need to be assembled, okay? And then transcription happens uh, much later. So the idea is to collect these early embryos 19 minutes after they have been laid, so in, in a window of 90 minutes, and prepare an extract. And uh, it turned out that this is a much, much more potent extract for chromatin assembly. And so I then uh, developed this extract further. And um, this actually started my independent career as a group leader at EMBF. So here you see, this is not me then, this is a later picture, but uh, the paper was actually published in 1992. It was initially rejected because the reviewer said, a single reviewer in JBC said, we don't need a system like that because we already have frog extracts for chromatin reconstitution. Who cares about Drosophila extracts? Anyway, so, um, so then with this extract, we actually were able to reconstitute DNAs one hypersensitive sites in vitro. And it turned out to be an ATP dependent process and uh, this is a paper here, and you may wonder why am I not the first author? And uh, why was the paper published only in 1994? So that explains it. In, I, I moved to the EMBL in 1991 already, and, and I it, you know, it handed over everything, my kids and my reagents to Toshi Tsukiyama. And he then uh, did the real experiment. In the meanwhile, I set, my, set up my lab at EMBL, and I write here, um, hired on the base of, um, of uh, outstanding research proposal and lots of promise. So my research proposal was indeed, I said, I will reconstitute pre-plastoderm Drosophila development in a test tube, starting from this extract and putting in components and so forth. And at the time, so, so they liked it, it was innovative, but I can tell you nothing of this worked at all at least 30 years ago or not. Now, you know, we are, you know, we are, we are moving along. <laughs> anyway, um, so, but uh, what did work, of course, was to characterize the, the chromatin that we, uh, we reconstituted. And work in Carl Wu's lab uh, by Toshi Tsukiyama, 
and then in my lab, and then in parallel by Jim Cardonaga lab, uh, identified these remodeling factors that now everybody knows are the I-switch type remodeling factors. And the nucleosome remodeling ATPases, is there are four categories and we discovered the I-switch um, remodeling factors. So Carl Wu found the NERF complex, we found the crack complex and Jim Cardonaga found the ACF complex. And um, so that was a huge breakthrough at the time, the first uh, realization of nucleosome remodeling. Um, and we would actually look at pictures like that. We, we would do chromatin assembly in the absence and the presence of ATP. And I'm sure many of you know that when you get with micrococcal nucleus digestion, this kind of a pattern that shows you there's regular nucleosome arrays and chromatin looks good and so forth. And that required ATP. In the, present, in the absence of ATP, there was still all the histones were on the DNA, but they were not regularly spaced. And now my question for you, so to speak, I don't want an answer, but uh, where do you think the transcription factors can bind better? So you could say, uh, this is totally organized, perhaps not so well, but that's actually the wrong answer. The transcription factors are able to bind under those conditions when the chromatin fiber is beautiful. And uh, the activity that makes the chromatin fiber beautiful is the crack complex that we purified. And um, we then later found out why this is, namely, uh, these I-switch type nucleosome remodeling factors are nucleosome sliding factors. So they, they, they move nucleosomes on chromatin I, all the time, we think. And so um, even though, and the arrays are always nicely spaced, there are windows of opportunity where transcription factors can bind their binding sites. And then actually the nucleosomes will realign with respect to the bound protein. So this was my little excursion. Uh, we worked on the remodeling factors for quite some time and on dosage compensation. And only in the last couple of years, four or five years, we started to use this extract again, but now with a different input. So, because now we are reconstituting the whole, the entire Drosophila genome. We purify DNA from any source of Drosophila. The fragments are around 100 uh, kilobase long. We put them into the extract, ATP, everything, and chromatin assembles, uh, beautiful micrococcal nucleus ladders. Because this is an in vitro system, we can incorporate histone H1, the linker histone, because normally the, the early embryonic extract lacks H1, so we can actually tune it a bit. And it turns out this, this uh, 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 chromatin is complex, it contains about 500 proteins that Axel Imhoff, my colleague, was actually able to identify by mass spectrometry. It contains anything that you want. So um, when we look at how does the chromatin look like by microscopy, uh, we actually see that the chromatin condenses into these uh, yeah, condensates, it's polymer condensates, we think. And so we consider that in these particles or aggregates or condensates, the chromatin organization presumably is very similar to physiological in terms of packing and so forth. So this is the system that we are now using. And in the system, there are some DNA binding proteins already. For example, in Drosophila, there are insulator proteins. One is called suppressor of hairy wing. You know, CTCF, you may know better, but these is the kind of activities that do long range interactions. So the one called suppressor of hairy wing is present and it binds to more than 2,200 sites in the genome. And we are mapping all the nucleosomes, right? In this in vitro reconstitutes and we compare it to in vivo. And we can actually see that around the suppressor of hairy wing binding sites, we see well positioned nucleosomes, phased nucleosomes. You may know these arrays uh, that are close to promoters, the plus one nucleosome, plus two, and so forth. But in these insulator sites, the arrays are on both sides, right? And so we actually see, and this is our quality control, that there are proteins binding and chromatin is organized, and we wonder about long range interaction. So, but now we can, of course, add proteins that are not present. The clamp protein, for example, is not present in the extract. 
And so here we add in clamp, and you can actually see this is now essentially the clamp binding sites, 4,000 clamp binding sites that we look at. Um, and in the absence of clamp, there is very little nucleosome patterning, but in the presence of clamp, you see the nucleosome, there's a nucleosome free region, and then the nucleosomes line up left and right. And the reason why they line up is because of these ATP dependent nucleosome sliding activities. If we omit ATP from this reaction, a clamp will not be able to bind and nucleosomes will not be arranged. So it's a highly dynamic system that allows integration of transcription factors. And this is what we think happens in pre-blastoderm development, where the chromatin is initially open, very dynamic, and then transcription factors come in, and then the whole process of genome activation is started. So now we use CLAMP and MSL2 to see whether there's cooperativity. And of course, the idea would be that uh, perhaps chromatin would suppress the binding on autosomes and only the X chromosomal binding would be maintained. So you see here, we add MSL2. This is now 300 functional sites. MSL2 binds very poorly, but when you add the clamp, there is a strong cooperativity. Interestingly, the opposite is also true. Clamp at these sites, um, binds very poorly, but if you put MSL2, then it binds very strongly. So they really cooperate. Yeah? And we know that if we delete the physical interaction domains, that cooperativity is lost. So here is the situation now. We have the situation that MSL2 and CLAMP really cooperate on these MREs. The problem, however, is that, okay, we look at this genome-wide in vitro, and we see essentially that all the in vivo binding sites here, this is, these are the chromosomes to L to R and so forth, the X chromosome in vivo. Uh, so here are the functional elements. So all of them are bound in chromatin, but there are still very many sites on the autosomes as well. So in other words, um, the problem has not been solved. The problem is actually not to identify the functional binding sites, they're all bound. The problem is to prevent the non-functional binding sites. And so that, um, that triggers a new uh, way of thinking. So nucleosomes or histone H1, we did this as well, they do not suppress the non-functional binding sites. So, um, well, how about other GAGA binding factors? We had realized that there was another protein in uh, Drosophila, the so-called GAGA factor. It actually has been worked on forever. The GAGA factor binds GAGA sequences here. And we noted that GAGA factor never binds to the non-functional bindings, uh, to, to the functional binding sites, okay? So we added the GAGA factor to our in vitro reconstitutes. And uh, this is a complicated picture here. I'll just show you an example. And the example goes as follows. Uh, you have MSL2, it binds to a functional site and it binds to a non-functional site. If we add the GAGA factor, it only binds to the functional site and not to the non-functional site because GAGA factor binds to the non-functional site. So apparently GAGA factor competes outcompetes binding at wrong sites. Yeah. So the targeting se selectivity is not intrinsic to the proteins, but there are other proteins that prevent them to bind elsewhere. And uh, the question is, of course, why does GAGA factor not compete everywhere? Because GAGA factor is actually a very abundant protein. It's a pioneer protein. It's present in the pre embryo extract. And the um, the simple answer is GAGA factor actually needs GAGAG as a minimal binding unit. And if you look at these sequences, the MRE or the Pionic sequences, they do not have GAGAG. Uh, well, you could say, but in this, um, in this position weight matrix, there is the possibility that there is GA here and then it makes GAGAG. So from just looking at this, you cannot answer this. In order to answer this, you have to do what is called the shape analysis, the DNA shape analysis. And 
there, this is published work. If you're interested in, you can also ask later. The point is uh, Gaga factor and dosage compensation recognize different DNA shapes. And, uh, and the interesting observation for us was that DNA shape feature, like uh, how exactly the, the bases uh, lead to, you know, propeller twist and roll and so forth is uh, maintained in chromatin organization. That was, for me, that was unpredictable. Okay, so we have now this scenario, uh, cooperativity and competition. Oops, sorry. So the problem is still not solved. Uh, there is actually, um, the, the, we still bind very many non-functional sites. Uh, how are we doing with time? Probably, okay, good. So um, now comes actually, I think even a more in interesting part. Uh, what could be missing? So we looked whether the Pionex sequence recognition is evolutionary conserved by looking at different Drosophila species. You know, they all do dosage compensation. They all use these components. Do they do the same thing? It turns out that some of the Drosophila species have uh, very few Pionex motifs, and then they're highly enriched on the X chromosome, like in Drosophila. And others have many Pionex sequence motifs, and they are not enriched at all. And so Drosophila virilis, for example, um, does not apparently use Pionex motifs as the most important distinction for, of the X chromosome. So how then does Drosophila virilis do this? So we looked at the Drosophila virilis MSL2 protein, and this summarizes uh, a lot of analysis, and it shows that Drosophila virilis MSL2 does not use the CXC domain to uh, uh, to bind MRE sequences. There is structural work, there is domain swap work, DIP work is published uh, last year. So in other words, in that closely related Drosophila species, the, the Virilis does it differently. Now closely related means 40 million years of evolution. Okay. So the question is if we take the Drosophila Virilis protein, can it identify the X chromosome in Drosophila melanogaster? And so this is a transfection experiment with a GFP tag protein. And you see the melanogaster protein binds the chromosomal territory. Whenever you see this coherent territory, everything is fine. And the virilis, even though it does not recognize pionic sites and so forth, also can find the X chromosome. Okay. Now we do the same thing in female cells. In female cells, the melanogaster protein can reprogram the female cells to become male-like. And you can tell this because MSL2 now, even in female cells, binds to the X chromosome. But the virilis protein cannot. Actually, it binds all over the place. So, um, we think that a functional dosage compensation complex is assembled because the, all the different components, including lysine 16 acetylation are present, but they are not in a coherent X chromosomal territory. So what happens? So we thought, well, perhaps the Drosophila, so there is a male specific component lacking. So to help the Drosophila virilis. And so we did a proteomic analysis to see whether we could pull down a, a, a specific component. And to our surprise, what we found very dominant is that the virilis protein interacted with the clamp protein super tightly. It interacts with clamp. So here's the virus MSL2. It interacts with clamp more tightly than with the remaining complex. So strong clamp interaction. It, actually, it turns out the interaction of the virilis protein with clamp is so tight that uh, the clamp moves of MS, the virilis MSL2 to all the autosomal sites. 85% in a chip of all the wrong binding sites are now clamp binding sites. 
So this protein that does not contain the intrinsic DNA binding recognition of the X chromosome is more derouted by the clamp protein to autosomes. So how can this be prevented? There must be another male specific factor. So the only other male specific factor that we know of is actually the ROX RNA. And it actually turns out that it is the ROX RNA that makes all the difference here. So if you transfect MSL2 into a female cells, the first thing that will, it will do, it will activate transcription of the ROX RNA. And then the complex can assemble. And this is the reason why MSL2 can reprogram female cells. And it turns out the virilis MSL2 cannot induce the ROX transcription because it cannot bind to these pionex sites. And the pionex site here regulates ROX transcription. So the idea is, well, can we help the Drosophila virilis protein by giving it some ROX RNA? And this is what we have done. We are adding here the virilis transfected and then the ROX transcribed from a, uh, from a ubiquitous promoter. And yes, suddenly, we can, in the presence of rocks, we can generate territory and we can, you can see this by chromatin immune precipitation. Now, all the binding is on the X chromosome in the absence of RNA, in the presence of RNA and so forth. So the rocks RNA, as we found and Asifa after Akta's lab also found, binds in the C terminus of this MSO2. And so, <laughs> So again, everything happens there. The whole uh, you know, specificity negotiation happens there. So um, it turns out that Drosophila melanogaster also requires the ROX RNA. It's just that we weren't able to see this before because whenever we put MSO2, the ROX RNA is also there. So we used ROX deleted mutant flies uh, and we took the larvae, larval brains, and did cut and run, and so forth. And it turns out that on all the high affinity sites we looked, in the presence of rocks, there is a peak, and the absence of rocks, not present, absence, presence, absence, and so forth. So how could a long non-coding RNA uh, tune the specificity of such a protein? So it could be that uh, in the complex, it has an allosteric component. It just uh, somehow modulates the conformation of the binding domain so that it now binds an even extended motif. So that uh, we have to test. We think that the ROX RNA prevents derouting by clamp. So perhaps it counteracts this cooperativity with clamp. Um, and um, this is still something we need to test. In the paper we published, there is actually a little hint that this may be one of the mechanisms. Um, so it could be that uh, the dosage compensation as complex assembly is localized. It, it doesn't happen in the nucleoplasm, but on the DNA. This is an interesting uh, suggestion we are uh, trying to test. But there could be also be a qualitatively different binding uh, mode. And so the last two slides, I'll, I'll show you which I find the most amazing uh, finding, namely, the dosage compensation complex, once it binds to the X chromosomal territory, binds extremely tightly. And that we can see by um, FRAP experiments, fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. So these are experiments where you monitor how quickly a complex exchanges uh, on, on the DNA. And it turns out that the MSL2 GFP essentially sits on DNA for many minutes. And there are very few proteins for which such a binding is known. And all the complexes are essentially topologically associated with chromatin. Histones, for example, are long binders and uh, the elongating polymerase and PCNA, the sliding clamp and so forth. And MSL2, this complex has the same property. So we don't understand that, but we found that this property absolutely depends on the long non-coding RNA. So if we, in the absence of the RNA, 
when the protein binds all over the place, it will actually diffuse very fast. But in the presence of the, in the RNA, when there is the chromosomal territory, it will actually remain rock solid. And so we think that this may be part of the answer. Once the complex binds to the proper binding site, something happens RNA dependent and it gets stuck and it doesn't diffuse anymore. So we wonder whether this is actually part of the mechanism that initially all the, all the sites are scanned, but whenever you find the right site, the RNA wraps around, let's say, and uh, it traps the protein there. So this is a bold hypothesis that we need to test in the future. So 40 million years of evolution uh, of two Drosophila species. Uh, they both have the uh, goal or the, 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 the goal to establish dosage compensation that the complex binds to the X chromosome. What they apparently have is a protein called MSL2 with a CXC domain. They have other GA binding uh, proteins that they can play with, and they have a long non coding ROX RNAs. Apparently, the two species took several, several routes. In Melanogaster, we have Pionex sites. The CXC domain uh, binds to the Pionex site, and there's lots of, in this is apparently very important. And there's a role of the CLAM protein at MLEs and uh, MREs, and there's also a role for ROX RNA. But in Virilis, um, there are no Pionex sites, and therefore there's a larger role for the CLAM protein, and there seems to be a larger role for the ROX RNA as well, and the CXC domain has a minor role. So this shows that starting from a limited set of components giving 40 million years of evolution, the evolution has reached that goal of X chromosome specific targeting by you know, playing with these things and using them differently. And that requires that certain things co-evolve. For example, pionex sites on the entire chromosome, on the entire genome are limited to the X chromosome in Melanogaster. All the autosomal sites must have been mutated away, right? And along with this genome evolution, there is evolution of the DNA binding domain of MSL2, the cooperative interactions, CLAMP is stronger, and the relative uh, importance of long non-coding RNA. So this is snapshots of divergent evolution. Of, this is my title, essentially. And here I have reached my end. I would like to thank my team and the people that were very important in this, Nick Eggers and Rafi Villa. Rafi actually uh, was a PhD student in the lab uh, of Luciano Di Croce when uh, Marcus arrived there as a postdoc. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We have time for a few questions. As usual, I would give students priority if someone dares. If not, I will hand over to PIs. At the Gordon Conference, PhD students got drink tickets if they were old enough to ask questions. So don't be shy. <laughs> That's something you can try. <laughs> I thank you for the, the talk. It was really beautiful. So I have just one quick question about the GAF, the GAF factor. So do the, the GAF mutant also has a phenotype on, on this kind of uh, balance? Because yeah. I, I think if you don't have GAF, you, you, have a, you disrupt the balance and you may also have male lethality. Yeah, um, actually it, it was as a footnote on one of the slides, but I did not point it out. Um, in, I think in 2004 it was, Paul Schädel described a hypomorphic uh, uh, mutant of the GAGA factor. This is the, tri the uh, trithorax-like gene. And he described that uh, there was an enhanced male-specific lethality and the dosage compensation complex was localized to the X chromosome more. Um, it was, this was actually, we didn't know this, um, but when we were asked uh, what's the physiological relevant of all your in vitro reconstitutions, we found this work and we found this extremely gratifying. So the biochemistry can resolve all genetic problems. Thank you. That's beautiful.
Thank you, Peter, for the beautiful talk and quite inspiring, I have to say. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one is regarding uh, your last data, which is, I think, very nice uh, about row X, you know, the, the capacity to block MSL2 uh, in chromatin. So do you think this um, involves the whole complex, MSL complex, or just MSL2? So is there is a dynamic going on there? Because we know it's quite dynamic, you know, the loading of the complex. Yeah. So how do you interpret this? Uh, yeah. So to be honest, uh, this super tight binding, you know, like minutes and minutes on, on DNA is totally unusual. And actually at the Gordon conference, everybody said, how can this work? Um, I, I, I didn't, when we first found it uh, in 2000, whatever, 15 years ago or so, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, well, I believed it, but then I, I, I stopped to believe in it because all the interactions are so subtle, you know, DNA, shape, and so forth. So we repeated this experiment three times uh, in five-year uh, uh, distances, and, um, and it is true. And most recently, we started to look at the other components, uh, MSL3, which is the epigenetic reader component of the complex, and it is also tight binding. Mm -hmm. So... At this, because of course you're totally right. It could be that MSL2 just binds and everything else is dynamic and the complex uh, disassembles and diffuses off. And at the moment, to my surprise, it seems like the whole complex is stable. On the other hand, if you consider a stable complex on the chromosome and then there's transcription and so forth, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I don't think you want such a super stable complex. And so, then, so I should also say the, the FRAP uh, does, has no spatial resolution. Mm -hmm. it, it could actually be that there, that, you know, uh, the, I think the term is kinetic uh, dominance, is that actually there is uh, uh, dynamics at a short range. So, you know, something uh, uh, dissociates and it is immediately recaptured in the vicinity because I don't know what, because of the long, long coding RNA. So, um, uh, we don't know yet whether this thing binds super tightly and never like topological, you know, cannot get off, or whether uh, the, there is dynamics, but if we had the resolution, we would see that it's a constant on, off, on, off, and it doesn't leave the X chromosome territory. Mm -hmm. So this is the trick. It does not leave the territory. It doesn't leave the X chromosome. And I think this is an important question that we need to address in the future. Mm -hmm. And the second question is regarding GAGA protein. Uh, so I didn't understand um, completely the relationship between GAGA protein and, and uh, CLAMP. So is there any competition in the outside of the X chromosome or, is, or they just work together? So um, many of the GAGA sequences in the fly genome are long stretches of GAGA. And so uh, you can find clamp and GAGA next to each other or on same sites on autosomes and so forth, simply because, you know, essentially they both have space and so forth. It is just that on the functional sites on the MREs, there GAGA cannot bind and CLAMP binds together with, M with uh, MSL2. Mm -hmm. But on the sites that look a little similar but are non-functional, there the GAGA can bind. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think this is one component of this, uh, uh, you know, one component of uh, installing specificity. GAGA factor and CLAMP are both very abundant and they are pr present relatively early in development. They both have been called pioneer factors. They both recruit the nerve nucleosome remodeling complex. So in a way, they could well be in competition or in cooperation. But on these sides, um, they apparently sort out. So uh, to formulate it differently, the functional MREs have apparently evolved not to bind GAGA, mm -hmm. right? So that now M MSL2 can bind. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, just a quick note, uh, that I think GAGA is involved also in uh, structural, no? It was supposed, yeah. it was uh, proposed yeah. to be kind of helping to yeah. organize. So, so, um, so, so GAGA factor, um, 
is an oligomer. It's, it has been described as a hexamer, but it can oligomerize. And uh, apparently it also mediates long range interactions. So, you know, to bridge and bring together enhancers and promoters and so forth. And uh, there was actually a, a, a poster at the Gordon conference that Gaga factor is in what has been called hubs to bring things together. And, um, and I, I do not know what the relationship of this is to our dosage compensation problem. Hi, thank you, that was amazing. I, just a quick question. Do you know whether rocks RNA directly interacts with DNA forming some kind of structure? Yeah, of course, that, that, that would be the immediate uh, solution to the problem. If the rocks RNA would either make an R loop or a triple helix or something like that, we do not have evidence for that. So every once in a while we go and look again and we have done some experiments. We don't think this is the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I mean, and I'll take over if there are no more questions from the audience. Um, you mentioned pioneers factors. And you also mentioned in the beginning of your talk that probably you have a lot of dynamics in chromatin which open like default regions and then they create opportunities for binding. So what is your stand on this? To which extent do we pioneer factors really exist? And are that just a really a species of transcription factors or just an extreme in a complete range of transcription yeah. factors? So to be honest, in this extract system where there's lots of nucleosome sliding activity, um, every transcription factor that we add will actually be able to bind. So it could well be that in the early uh, preplastoderm development, this is what happens. It's just extremely open, no histone H1, nucleosome slide back and forth. And indeed, you would not need then uh, a pioneer quality, right? So uh, on the other hand, um, these proteins can bind to something like nucleosomal DNA. And we recently found another protein that we did genome-wide profiles on that actually binds just uh, on the side of a nucleosome. So um, I think it's too early to say, but it seems to be from this in vitro reconstitution, we may not even need pioneering quality. But you know, then very soon after this, uh, chromatin shapes and heterochromatin comes in and the compartments sort out. And then, of course, there are, you know, additional layers of differentiation. And I guess then you may need pioneer proteins. So then I have a question here from the online audience, anonymous, unfortunately. So you have shown from Melanogaster and Viridis two different flavors of mechanism. What can you say about the other species? Do you predict there are only two major categories? Or again, is this many different flavors? Yeah. Nice question. Thank you. Um, Actually, when we started the project on the evolution, we also looked at two other species, Drosophila buschii and Willistoni, and we actually cloned the MSL2s and we looked at the CXC domains. Um, the, the bottom line was all of them were different. Uh, some of them bound essentially every DNA sequence and some did not bind anything. And uh, we then had to decide uh, we had, had to focus, right? You always have to focus. And we focused on virilis, which seemed to be similar enough, but different enough to, to you know, be resolved. Um, it could well be that the other species have slightly different solutions to the problem. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So if there's no last urgent question, then I would like to thank our speaker again and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.